Hi friends! Welcome back, you're watching CJ. I'm CJ and we're gonna do a January wrap up today. Fun, fun, fun for everyone. Fun, fun, fun for everyone. You can't tell what is January and what is December easily. Okay, I think I figured it out. Um, I guess I started off the year reading Dear Centurion, which is a memoir by Akwege Meze. I read a lot of Akwege Meze's fiction work previously, um, and this was their memoir. It reflected the experience they have of being an embodied spirit, a lot of talk about um, spirituality and such related to their roots and the specific culture they're from. Also kind of gave you a peek under the hood at writers back end of like financial success and just like a really clear snapshot into how much they made per release and um, negotiating for future publishing deals and thinking through kind of fighting for their worth and fighting to get paid equitably. Overall like I, I actually ended up DNFing this book because it wasn't for me, it was just mine as a reader. I liked some of it a lot, um, and then some of it just kind of went over my head, which is fine. I think it was part of where I was in the reading year and part the subject matter itself, but I DNF'd it. I think I got about halfway through, and the parts I found most successful for me and the most interesting were kind of that back end, more technical, more statistical side of the publishing industry at large definitely shocks me how little authors make off of their books. Like $50,000 advances. That's not much money <laughs> if you're a full-time writer. I feel like to be a full-time writer you have to also be like a reviewer, teaching, like there has to be so many multiple streams of income to make yourself stay afloat unless you're, you know, a super well-known person and you can get those big advances. But interesting. Talked a lot about gender and the non-binary and trans experience. Okay, and then I read Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. I think I read this because Hannah recommended it to me. I really liked this book. So I was kind of suspicious going in. It seemed like a little commercial, a little like Bridget Jones diary -y, which might just be like my Americanness coming for me. That like so that like dry, uh, sarcastic tone of voice was just similar to what I remember Bridget Jones being. I don't know, take that with a caveat. But this follows a what, like storyograph, I love her, but her review section is not as popping as Goodreads. And there's also not accurate summaries of what the book is about. So when I'm recording and reviewing these, I really think I have to look at Goodreads, which is annoying. Okay, yeah, this novel is about a woman named Martha who, grows up in kind of a chaotic household. Uh, her parents are battling alcoholism and kind of the other various enabling behaviors that happens when one parent has alcoholism and one doesn't. And she is battling throughout the way, uh, throughout adolescence into her 40s. The book kind of starts at the fracture of her marriage to a man named Patrick and kind of recounts back what got her here and I guess like the journey her life took and the journey her mental health took her on as well. So she's battling with an unknown, unnamed mental illness, which I think is a little bit different. It had like this mask of intrigue and kind of, I think what the author's point was, you don't need to name the thing. Like the, the diagnosis is actually maybe sometimes harmful for people when they're trying to emphasize or, um, just like relate or provide care to someone with mental illness because the diagnosis often come with so much stigma that is maybe not even related to that person's individual experience so like whether it's schizophrenia borderline personality disorder deep depressive episodes whatever this character is dealing with it's unnamed um but i would say it's like in that bucket of psychosis they deal with really intense long bouts of depression where sometimes they act out and hurt the people they love the most during them and often even have suicidal ideation. So follows this woman named Martha. She's kind of like a miserable creature. 
um, her family and her friends have all kind of hit their their limit with her. Their empathy reserves are running dry and I really thought this book was like both really funny in a dry sarcastic way and just really honest and not coddling of anyone in who has ever found themselves in this situation. It didn't baby Martha who is the person who's dealing with the mental illness. It didn't like paint everyone in her life with a savior complex. It just showed kind of the wear and tear reality of what it's like to love someone whose brain is a little fucked up. Um, and I liked it. It was just like sweet and kind of heartwarming at the same time and like very human and compassionate. Definitely DWM vibes. I mean, it's like the unlikable female narrator trope, um, but she truly is a depressed woman moving, okay? <laughs> And then I read Seek You, which is a graphic novel by Kristen Ratka. Um, the subtitle of this book is A Journey Through American Loneliness. I thought this book was okay. Um, it kind of was walking the line between being hyper personal about like the narrator's relationship with the idea of loneliness herself and then looking broader into American culture and the zeitgeist and like thinking more critically about why we as a nation seem to be so singular and insular and removed from one another and from our own communities and I think it didn't really pay off that teetering of that line well enough for me um, and sometimes it felt disjointed. I would say this is like pretty depressing in tone. Um, there were sections of it that I like had to not read because there was such a bummer like stuff about animal testing and um like forcing human experiments and animal exper experiments to be in isolation from one another and it was all illustrated so it was just like really sad. <laughs> I think it's worth it if you can pick it up from a library or something and you are into graphic novels as a form. Definitely something that I'm interested in more reading but I'm not sure like where I should go next. I feel like Good Talk by Mira Jacobs has been recommended to me a ton and then Perpolisus? Perpolisus? Something with a P um which I've seen the cover of a lot that's like where other people tell me to go. And then I read Zula by Toni Morrison. I love Toni Morrison. I need to, I, I actually saw Greg at Supposedly Fun saying, I saw Greg at Supposedly Fun saying that he wanted to read her in publication order, I believe, which I think would be such a fun project to do sometime in my life. I've kind of just been bouncing around, um, but that is something I'm interested in reading her from publication date forward. Sula is about female friendship, to put it simply. Um, it follows Sula and Nell, who are both young black women growing up in somewhere in the in the midwest i want to say ohio they're kind of like in this mountaintop holler if you will um where i think like that the, the set of place that is expressed in solo 2 is really interesting like even like the geographical redlining that was already happening and tony morrison was just like calling out and making a reference to um was interesting in this in this narrative. This little black part of this community is nestled in the mountains. They oversee a valley where like all of the rich farming land is and everything and all of their resources are harder to acquire because of like the actual terrain is rockier and less easy to maintain and just not super accessible in general. And as the narrative goes on and these characters visit and come back and remove from the town that they're from. That's a small Ohio town. Uh, the inverse happens and suddenly all of the white rich farmers want to buy their land so they can have the view and they can oversee what becomes like a valley. Um, so I don't know, there's a very strong sense of place in this in this town is basically what I'm saying. Um, I feel like Toni Morrison is so good at actualizing not only characters and their relationships to each other, and not just main characters, I mean tertiary, like random side characters that are kind of red threaded throughout some of her stories. Like I think some of these Sula characters showed up in Beloved if I'm not mistaken, or she's just reusing some of the names. Um, but anyway, she's not only so good at characterization and just like making people feel fully formed, 
and almost out of almost like at an outer reach at the same time like i can see them i can picture them but not all of them is made accessible to the reader at the beginning i, I feel like you you learn more as you spend time with them and she's just so good she's so good at characterization and also conjoining that with a sense of place and how place is really inherent to people and community and how we show up in our daily lives and treat one another so anyway uh this book is about female friendship between sula and nell like i said they kind of share some traumatic experiences in their young adolescence and then their paths divide pretty radically um this book is structured through chapters that correlate to years so we're kind of like following them from youth up until they're in their 40s and it was just really engrossing and heart-wrenching and fully fleshed the story of these two women without spoon feeding the reader if you like stories of female friendship i'm gonna say it again honestly it was giving neapolitan novels it was giving elena and lena okay like frenemy best friend like found family vibes that have seen each other through through everything and like kind of hate each other but love each other deeply at the same time if you like that kind of thing and are a huge fan of perfect prose read sula by tony morrison i think a project in my life will definitely be reading from publication date and then i read five tuesdays in winter which is a collection of short stories by lily king i feel like you will probably know lily king because of writers and lovers which was like a big buzzy novel a couple of years ago which i loved i loved my reading experience of that i think with any short story collection it's hard to summarize it but it was very character driven there are stories about loss and heartache and abuse and people trying to step in and be pillars of support for other people uh, i think this collection in particular was like really cinematic it felt visual to me i think similarly to morrison um lily king is really good at evoking a sense of place right and a lot of these felt very northeastern to me it felt very like cozy bundled up in new england and the kind of hot humidity that comes in that area's summertime and was very evocative of new england in general for me i'd say they're all pretty like slice of life short stories the first one in particular is the one that stuck out to me and has stayed with me the most which is about kind of this obsessive young babysitter who is babysitting for a rich family and she becomes kind of enthralled by this older brother figure who's there he's much older than her he's probably like 30 and she's 13 or 14 i think and the mind games that happen between that power balance and power divide divide and the manipulation and psychological and physical abuse that that young girl character moves through and like it's so wrapped up in the guise of um like a boy liking her or being able to be seen by him in a different way she's right at that cusp of you know 13 14 going into real teenagehood and i don't know the 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 frame of mind that she was in and also how she couldn't even process the inappropriateness of the much older man responding to her in any way like that was just felt really real and vivid to me and i think it was really great and well done and then lastly i finished the fire next time by james baldwin i started this in 2021 and i finished it in 2022 um this is an essay collection really but it's just two letters that were written on the anniversary of the anniversary of the emancipation proclamation and one the first the first letter in this is a letter to his nephew that is kind of a wish for his future but also uh giving him like an account and a glimpse into like his personal family's past and like his hopes and dreams for him to move through a world that is different than the one he had to move through at the same age 
and then the second is and then the second is a more general letter kind of recounting his childhood in the church and his involvement with the black panther movement and his relationship meeting the black muslim party and kind of picking through his how he became like a a writer's voice on race in america and really is a call to action of just abolishing white supremacy and showing the consequences of it um in really plain language it's really powerful and beautiful and i think you should read it if you haven't much too timely you know i would say it's like pretty optimistic and compassionate in tone uh more than oppressors at large deserve that is absolutely true and I don't know there's just like such a kernel of light and wisdom in James Baldwin and I just felt like really his cutting cutting prose was just like so sharp you gotta read it so that's what I read in January it's kind of a sleepy month you know we're just kicking off the year I'm doing a themed reading vlog so I'm almost done with the second book for that there's gonna be three in total it's taking me two weeks a grace I am not. I can't read three books in a week. <laughs> um, but I hope you're doing well. I'm tired. Can you tell I'm tired? I'm kind of low energy, but I hope you're doing okay. Uh, the sun's out in Portland today. That's all that matters. Cool. Love you. Bye.